Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday morning here at Accenture's new technology lab. Welcome. We have, I'm, my name is Karen Tucker, by the way. I'm CEO of the Churchill Club. And I think we have a real treat in store for us this morning uh, with Rajat Baharia, Patrick Sawyer, Jim Whitehead, and our moderator, David Featherston Haw, talking about gamification of everything. The genesis of the program was a prediction that Bing Gordon made on the Churchill Club stage last year <coughs> that gamification of everything will be one of the top trends that we will see explosive growth in about five years' time, so about four years' time at this point. And so this panel is here to dive down and really look at the opportunities that that represents for all of us. I would also like to extend a very big thank you to Accenture for opening their doors to us. Would you please help me in thanking them? <laughs> a very brief introduction to Churchill Club for those in the audience less familiar with us. We are a 27-year-old premier business and technology forum that is dedicated to encouraging innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through the up to 40 programs that we present each year where like minds can connect with one another and with ideas. We are a nonprofit and we are member supported and if you would like to join us, we would welcome you to do so. We have an outstanding set of programs coming up over the next month or so and beyond, of course, um, including Shell Oil Company President Marvin Odom, that's tomorrow at the Rosewood Sand Hill the incoming ARM CEO, Simon Seagars, next week up in the city for a breakfast on May 9. Massive sensors and data here at Accenture, another in our series to examine the top trends. And the 15th annual top 10 trends event uh, here in the Santa Clara area in the South Bay on May 23rd. And these are just some of the programs coming up, so be sure to keep an eye on us and either get on the mailing list or just watch the website as the new programs get posted. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club and you will find other Twitter quotes in your printed program. <coughs> Our moderator, David Featherstonhoff, has a truly diverse background. He's a Stanford guy, having earned three advanced degrees there, including a PhD in psychology he is an entrepreneur at heart, I think, having founded and led two venture-backed companies through several growth stages. He's led large-scale research projects in areas such as terrorism, environmental protection, and health risks. And after the global, uh, the financial meltdown in 2009, he got back to his roots and his core interest of behavioral uh, science. And he had the idea to bring it to the world in the wild, real time, instead of academia, which is where most behavioral scientists resided at that time. And so he put together a road show and he took it out to companies and his pitch started with, I think you need a behavioral economist. Most of the time that was met with blank stares. <laughs> one time, however, one very important time, it wasn't. They said, we do, and that was IDEO. And today, David is a behavioral economist at IDEO. Let's give him our warmest welcome this morning. So can you hear me? OK, welcome. So um, uh, give me a show of hands. How many people have played a game this morning? Six? OK. Actually, you're all playing a game. The, uh, the name tag, we, if you think of the, one of the benefits of the Churchill Club is networking. And the challenge is, how can I find the people that I want to talk to? And so we've all categorized you and you've selected out there a game player, game maker, uh, game spectator, or game curious as a way to kind of help you find each other. How many commuted uh, this morning to, to here? Okay, you've also played that game, <laughs> which is a multiplayer game called driving, right, which is all about cooperation. And we're actually going to start right now with a third game. I guarantee you've actually played others. You, you may not see it that way at the end of this hour. We hope you will. Um, and uh, this game, I'm actually just going to start the timer now, is called the thumb game. 
It's another um, multiplayer game, and I want you to put your drinks down in your phones and turn to the player next to you, and we're going to play the thumb game. So I can't do it with myself because my thumbs are <laughs> to grab. And the, the goal of the game is to get as many pins as you can of your partner's thumb. Okay, and let's start it. Okay, start at 30 seconds. <laughs> Five, there you go. Four, yeah, okay. four, three, two, go. <laughs> okay. Uh oh. I've never lost this game. Okay, I so I'll let you know. Hook hands like this, right? Like this. I think it's a losing yeah, proposition. And then, <laughs> and then you do that. Oh. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you got me. Uh, I've never seen this okay. <laughs> All right, five more That's seconds. Tough job, huh? <laughs> okay. All right. So. I need, uh, who think they may have won in the group the most pins? Okay, how many? Three? All right, so this is what usually happens, right, is that we automatically assume we need to compete. And if you think about it, if you were to cooperate with your opponent, uh -huh. you, could, mm -hmm. you could just pin, you know, one a second. And if we did this over 30 seconds, you would have had 30 <laughs> pins and you would have won, right? So, um, you know, I think we're trained to, to compete, and we think of, um, of this famous guy, uh, um, and here's what he said, sympathy is the strongest instinct in human nature. I think most of the games we play are really about cooperation, not about competition. And if you look at the stereotype of gamification, um, I, I think people often assume it's about competing, and certainly, you know, there is elements of, of what we do that's competing, but I think it's actually more about cooperation. So what I'm going to do is, over the next five minutes, just give you, have a bunch of um, the gamified world actually wash over you with some examples from the real world in, in different domains. So you can actually see what I see, and maybe we see, we'll find out, uh, from our panelists of what gamification actually is. So. Uh, how many of you heard this awesome phrase before? The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So um, I think one of the reasons I live here is because we have this incredibly biased sample of the future in Silicon Valley. And my guess is that's a lot of the reason why you guys are here too. So I want you to meet your future in gamification. So we gamify the workplace. So this is gamifying cubes, <coughs> this is Pixar, lets its animers, animators basically um, decorate huts and caves, which is where they work. Those are cubes in Pixar's world. Here's the, a bathroom experiment at IDEO. Off in the right, to, uh, there's a provocation. What are the unwritten IDEO core values? And these are solo bathrooms, so people go in there and are quite transparent about answering those questions. So this is one I had to put up here. That's me. This is another kind of useless interaction but actually it creates a sense of belonging and awesomeness at work, which really you know, translates into the thing that companies really want, which is productivity. So you can even actually gamify the urinal, right? So on the left is the sign, look, keep it in the bowl, people, men, right? That's a much more clever way to design a game, just put a fly in the urinal and men, am I right? We know exactly what to do and we play really well all the time. We're, we actually gamify driving. Right, so the sign on uh, the right works a lot better than the game on the left. Both of them are games, this one's just lame. That one, when you're speeding, a frowny face shows up and it works a lot better than even feedback of how fast you're going. Here's another one that IDEO did a couple years ago that would basically, it turns you know, a, um, a uh, climate change denier makes them look exactly like a tree hugger. Because what happens is when you're heavy on the pedal, then the, the flowers and the, the, the bush on the right starts to wither and go brown. When you're easy on the pedal, it actually blooms, right? So that's gamifying driving. We're gamifying K through 12, turning this, this kind, of, kind of slit your wrist game, right? Which is clearly a game. Um, and grades are the scorecard. Do you know what that is? Broccoli. What about this? A good old friend. Do you know yeah. what this is, honey? Celery. Who knows what that is? Uh, a pear. A pear, no. A turnip. No? Okay, I'm going to give you the first word. Egg. Egg. 
egg salad. <laughs> okay. So there is no shame. It's all great fun, and they're learning a ton, a lot more than in, than in the other one. We're actually gamifying our genes. So the, the game, and I won't name the company, delivers uh, your genome personally to your desktop. Actually, and this is the report. Actually, before this, they say, hey, do you really want to know this? Really, do you want to know this? No, seriously, do you really want to know what we're about to show you? OK, here we go. The thousand ways you're going to die, right? Which is not a great on-ramp to your, to your personal genome. Instead, Genentech asked, in this case, IDEO, to create a different on-ramp that actually will kind of attract you in. And since all of our basically swab your teeth in 24 hours, you get back your unique genome, and we basically put it to music. So this is a unique song that represents your unique, unique genome, which is a much more pleasing introduction to your future life with your genes. We even gamify bath time. And um, if for those of you who are parents and have gone, gone through bath, uh, bath time woes, you can have Elmo call you. This is something we created recently. Um, and this is what happens. You can queue it up for 7.30 p.m. When, when bath time is. And it's like, oh, look, honey, Elmo's calling, right? And then this is when you answer it. This is, um, <laughs> this is the, 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 the game that often is played. And the Elmo game is the one that reinvents uh, bath time. Hi, it's Elmo. Elmo heard that it's time for your bath. Mm -hmm. Oh, Elmo can only talk for a minute because it's time for Elmo's bath, too. Ooh, Elmo loves taking a bath. Elmo scrubs his whole body with soap. <laughs> and Elmo always remembers to wash between his toes. When Elmo's done, he shakes off his fur like this. <laughs> do you do that? No, you don't have fur. <laughs> oh, what's that, Mommy? Uh-oh, uh -uh. Elmo has to go before the water gets cold. Bye-bye. Oh, come in, Mommy. Come in, come in, come in. Bye-bye. OK, so um, that's, that's uh, bath time reinvented. We're often asked at IDEO, what's the future of X? And uh, many times what's driving it is some crisis, right? And so we love this quote because there's opportunity and downside. And so we're a part of a large group that's basically gamifying uh, health and well-being. So this is from a uh, fun theory, I think, from VW. So it, it induces you to kind of take the stairs. Every time you take a step, a, a different piano note sh shows up. Um, uh, not everyone wants to exercise, but everyone does want to play. Thank you, we. Thank you, Connect, for reinventing exercise in the home. Here's another one, a little concept we created. Uh, we all look at the back of food labels, and that's a game, kind of, right? Think, you know, we look like we, it's actually useful, and it's actually informing our decisions. Uh, let's create a new currency about how long would I have to run to burn off this food product, which completely reframes my decision about what I will eat. So here's one from Massive Health. You basically snap your food, share it with your friends, they rate it, right? And when you aggregate, aggregate that over individuals and then over um, a nation, here's what it looks like. So this is a little video over time. Green is good food, red is bad food. So here we are in the morning time this is North America on the left. And you see at um, late at night is when America has right here is when it hands, has its hand in the chip bag, right? And so that gives you a whole new view of our national health in an inspiring way to kind of keep you on the path. And we're also actually gamifying financial well-being. So here's another little concept that basically creates a new currency and to change the purchase decision. Hey, I really want that shirt. How many hours do I have to work to actually earn that? Because you plug in your salary. Oh, no, thank you. I don't, it's not worth it for me to work five hours to, to uh, have that shirt. I'm going to pass. Thank you very much. And then another one is Bank of America keep the change. Do you know, slide the debit card. It rounds up and puts the change into your savings account. I've had a number of people come up to me after I said that IDEO created that. They grab me by the shoulders and they say, I love that. <laughs> So it's gamifying savings, right? So savings is no longer arduous. So it's just some, some examples from the world about gamification. And whether you like it or not, that's the way we're going. And to kind of launch us into our expert panel here, I've created three provocational hunches that uh, 
have, I think, some truth in them, and I'm sharing them as a way to kind of prod us, you as well, which you're going to participate in this discussion as well, but also these gents here. The first one is actually the world is already gamified. The gamification of everything is more about our journey to replace bad games with good ones. We're, all the, we're playing games all day long. We just don't look at it that way. Games are most powerful when they're not framed as games. Right? So if you're leveling up and earning points and getting your, your mayor badge, not to discount that. That's, that's a really cool, engaging world um, that is powerful, but not for everyone. When you create games that are, they actually, that are not framed as games, I think it ends up being applying to more people with more sticky behavior change. And then the third one is when you don't like an outcome, don't blame people, blame the game. It's not their fault, it's our fault. That's our opportunity to reinvent the future through um, engagement through games. So, what do you guys think of those three provocations? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, um, my, my name is Rajat Bahari. I'm the, the founder and chief product officer of Bunchball, also um, author of an upcoming book called Loyalty 3.0. How to Revolutionize Customer and Employee Engagement with Big Data and Gamification. It'll be out June 18th. And uh, I, I'm actually going to disagree with your entire definition of gamification, right? I think there's two different uh, ways people look at this word. And, and it's easy to get confused because it's got the word game in it. And some is like, let's look at the whole world as a game. Uh, there's actually three probably, right? One is the way you've kind of framed it, which is like, let's look at the whole world as a game. Everything we do is a game. There's rules, we're players, all that kind of stuff. The second is the actual game creators, like people who make video games who start with nothing and they create something and the whole purpose of that thing is to entertain, right? We're not talking about either one of those, at least not in our business, in my business. What we're talking about is the third thing, which is using these data-driven motivational techniques from video games to motivate business outcomes, right? At the end of the day, it's all about business results. It's not about uh, fun, it's not about entertainment. As, as you know, a thousand failed g game studios will tell you, like making a good game is hard, and then making one who's got an ulterior motive of like trying to teach you something or be an advertisement for something is even harder, right? And so what really this is about, it's not about like making the whole world fun, because fun is this really abstract concept, right? I think it's really hard to manufacture fun. I think the, the Tom Sawyer story is probably the best kind of apocryphal example of this, right? Tom is sitting there painting the fence, there's nothing he'd rather be doing less on a beautiful summer day. His Aunt Polly like said, you have to do this. And then his friends come by and start teasing him. Like, we're going down to the lake, we're gonna have fun. And he's sitting there going like, well, it sucks to be me because I'm sitting here painting this fence. But then he decides, I'm gonna act like there's nothing in the world I'd rather do more than paint this fence. And his friends start getting intrigued. Then they ask if they can help. Then they start offering to pay him to paint the fence, right? And at the end of the day, he's sitting there in the shade with all his riches and all his friends are painting the fence. They were all painting the fence, right? Tom was doing the same exact thing that all his buddies were. It was just a bit that flipped in people's head, people's perception of the task that changed. For Tom, it was work. For them, it was play. And I think that's one of the key things here about gamification is just turning things I have to do into things I want to do. And really, it's all about using data. At the end of the day, like I think what, uh, what Patrick's company does, my company does, we are now living in this world where everything we're doing is throwing off data our community life, our entertainment life, our work life. Everything's throwing off data and all that data can be used to motivate people using these techniques that video game designers have used for years. Things like fast feedback, like transparency, showing you exactly where you stand, giving you goals to accomplish, giving you badges that indicate expertise and achievement in a community, giving you uh, onboarding techniques that games do really well at training people without it feeling like it's being training. And then the social component, right? We're all inherently social creatures. So community, collaboration, competition, points as a way of keeping score, like all these mechanics that have been proven in the video game world, you can take and you can layer around business experiences, driving sales performance, driving help desk activity, driving training, driving collaboration, driving compliance, getting fans to engage more, en enhancing loyalty programs, all these opportunities, but it's really about data-driven motivation and less so about entertainment, fun, or games. Games are the wrong frame for this, actually. Okay, so Patrick, I see you nodding. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself, and then Jim, before you launch off, because I know you have a lot to say, Jim, then you yourself, introduce yourself as well. Uh, sure, so as a way of introduction, Patrick Stallier, I'm the CEO at Gigia. Uh, just to give you a sense of the perspective I'm coming from, uh, Gigia is a venture-backed company uh, backed by Benchmark Capital Mayfield Fund. We were started in 2007. Uh, we work with 700 enterprises, so these are really the largest consumer-facing businesses in the world, like 
uh, Verizon, Pepsi, Nike, NBC, and others. And we actually come from this from, from a, a little bit of an adjacent angle. Um, we have a platform that makes websites and applications social. So consider this as adding a social layer to a website or application. And a key component of this is driving and incentivizing behavior. So building off what Raja was talking about, um, that's something we care about a lot. We have our own gamification platform to, to do that. And uh, I will save my comments, but one of the things I'll just say as a starting point is, I think the term gamification is the worst thing to happen to gamification. Yeah. Um, it's just a term that I think it really can be bended and, and sort of positioned in ways where it's really not. So part of, I think, to begin this discussion is almost saying what, what this is not doing, what we're not talking about, and then that can help get us into uh, the real value that it can create. Right. Uh, so I'm uh, Jim Whitehead. I'm a uh, professor and chair of computer science at UC Santa Cruz. And I've uh, been engaged in some research projects around gamification and then uh, also want to uh, point out in the back my uh, PhD student, Chris Lewis, who is currently doing a PhD dissertation on gamification. And so uh, uh, he's actually at the point where he'd love comments on his dissertation. So uh, <laughs> you know, if you have interest in time and want to learn more, uh, uh, go, go see Chris. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, I would say, you know, I tend to agree with the observations about gamification as a term, although I kind of feel like the term is left to station, so yeah. we should yeah. probably get on with it. Although I'll, I'll be provocative and say one of the things I don't like about gamification is this uh, sense that Raja said, which is, you know, it's like this salt shaker that you can sort of, you know, okay, you know, this business process niche doesn't taste so good, so we'll take a little gamification salt on it and we'll taste so much better now, right? And I think that, in fact, sometimes you, uh, to make an activity more playful, sometimes, as David showed, you can take an existing activity, add some behavioral nudges to it, and make it more effective. But I think there's other situations where uh, you actually have to dive into the design of that activity and really change what's going on inside your business processes so that they actually will be um, more amenable to a more playful approach. So, so I may... Um I'll build off that. I think um, playfulness is an important part of gamification, but I actually think it takes a backseat to talking about um, this point of incentivizing behavior. And I think that's really what it comes down to is the core of what we're talking about here. And uh, incentivizing behavior, uh, first thing people think about when they think about gamification is points and rewards and or sort of badges. And I think that there's a place for that because if you think back to our childhood, uh, how many people in here got like gold stars for doing anything when they were in kindergarten, right? Raise your hand. There's a couple. So there, there's something inherently that we find satisfying about getting a star when we do an activity. There's something at our core. You can't avoid that. Like we've been doing that since we were, since we were kids. So that in itself will drive behavior. But I think there's actually things that you can go beyond that are actually even more satisfying. So that would be kind of one component to think about incentivizing behavior. But there's so many other examples, and, I, and I'll just touch on a couple very simple, simple ones. So LinkedIn, uh, on my LinkedIn profile, I've got the progress bar. And the progress bar tells me how far my LinkedIn profile is complete. I've been at 95% for about three years, and I can't figure out how to go to 5%. At least once a month, I go to LinkedIn to figure it out. And I don't know how to do it. If you guys know, let me know. <laughs> Um, but that's simple. Uh, it's great for LinkedIn because I'm filling out more of my profile. Mint.com does the same thing. So they're trying to get me to connect every one of my accounts to Mint. And I'm like creating bank accounts just to try to get to 100%. Um, I, don't, I really don't know how they do it. But uh, so you have that aspect, which is just I want to get to a goal, and that's very satisfying to me. Of course, the, the leaderboard concept, it, it's a simple concept, but it, it's really, I mean, it really gets at our core. Like, we, at our, at our core, we're competitive human beings. I mean, the, the, the example of the thumb fight, it just shows you what that means. So there's a, there's a deep satisfaction to knowing that I can uh, uh, get a higher score. Now, you have to be careful with that because if you're in, you know, 1,000th place and they're only showing the top 10, that's not very satisfying, so someone's going to give up. So that gets into the game design. But again, it's a core incentive. It's a core behavior. There's, there's status, right? That's been in the airline industry forever. And that's getting more nuanced. So I, again, I'd say the first thing you have to do is say it goes beyond points and badges, although those work, believe it or not, because it's at our core. And then there's these other incentives uh, that we need to start thinking about. So Patrick, um, so I have a kind of a different starting point than yeah. you. I kind of the, the currency that I think about is behavior and actually kind of the needs of, of users. And it sounds like you're, because of you know your enterprise, you guys 
kind of begin with the, um, the notion of the business. And so when you begin with behavior, you know, I really see gamification as, you know, this, this technique to create buoyancy, uh, to transition from one habit to another. So, and can you monetize that? Absolutely. Uh, is monetizing the point? In my world, sometimes, but it, it's usually not. It's a, a, a later filter is business. So when you look at it at that level, um, yes, these examples I showed were quite fun and engaging, but that to me is, that's just the surface point. The, the deeper point is actually behavior change and habit formation. So I wonder if through that lens, if you can talk sure. about your business and how you view the world, and does that change what counts for gamification for you? Yeah, I, I think habit formation is a, is a great lens to look at things. Um, you know, we, we talked about there's two constituents you serve when you're implementing this kind of stuff, right? One is the business. I mean, we're a business, Patrick's a business, like we need to make money, so we, companies need to pay us, and they're paying us for certain results that they want to have. So you have to start with the business and what their objectives are. We start every program with like the mission statement. We want a 20% increase in customer stat. Like that's in the good mission statement. And then from there, you figure out what are the KPIs? How are we going to measure this so we can determine whether we're successful or not? And then what are the data points that we can use to optimize this on an ongoing basis? So we understand the business and their objective really well. And on the other hand, you understand the user and what motivates them. Because in every context, it's different, right? If you're trying to get kids to exercise versus a sales team versus moms that are buying Chiquita bananas to engage in a marketing promotion, you've got different motivational triggers for each one of those groups. So one example I'll give you around habit change is a, uh, a nonprofit called Hope Lab in Redwood City, founded and funded by Pam Omidyar, the wife of eBay's founder. And her whole mission with Hope Lab is to combat childhood uh, health problems using technology. So their most recent initiative is called Zamzi, and it's all about combating the tween obesity problem. Trying to get, and the way they're doing it is trying to get kids to exercise more, to move more. So they built an activity monitor. It looks like a USB stick. The kids plug it onto their belt. They run around all day. It's kind of like Fitbit for kids, right? And then they plug it into the USB drive of the computer. It uploads all their activity data. For every 10 minutes that they spent in a certain activity zone, they earn points. If they do more than an hour, they get stars. Certain days are double points days. They have all their data graphed out for the last week, month, year, so they can kind of get their quantified self fix in there. And then they can unlock badges for hitting certain milestones. They can level up when they hurt, hit certain kind of long-term goals. They can take these points and they can spend them on virtual goods to customize an avatar that represents them in this community or on parent-funded dollar value goods, like an Angry Birds plush doll or an Amazon gift card. And by doing this, by integrating these motivational mechanics, again, data-driven motivation around their physical activity, they've been able to show a 59% increase in activity amongst these kids over the course of a six-month period where it's sustained. They just did a study with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the equivalent to them doing like 45 minutes of push-ups a week or something, like something crazy, right? And it's dropped uh, blood sugar levels and slowed the gain in, in bad cholesterol. So that as a way of like scaffolding these kids up, these kids that aren't going out and exercising anyway, that don't have any internal motivation to do it, but now you're applying these external motivators to get them out, to get them moving, and you're scaffolding them, scaffolding them up to a point where that stuff can fall away and they're starting to feel better about themselves. I can fit into better clothes, I can get up the stairs without being winded, people are asking me out, whatever it is, right? Like all of a sudden I feel better and now that intrinsic motivator takes over. And I think the really important part here about that kind of behavior and habit change is certain of these changes are really hard and the feedback loops are really long. Like I wanna lose five pounds, I go to the gym, I don't lose five pounds. It takes me a month of going to the gym to lose five pounds and not eating cupcakes and not sleeping in, right? And those are like immediate gratification, right? I would have loved to have stayed in bed today and eaten cupcakes, right? Like that would have been like the ideal morning, but that didn't happen, right? I'm here <laughs> with you guys, right? So, uh, so there's all these like immediate gratifications that you're trying to compete against to get this long-term abstract goal of losing weight. And it's really hard because it's so tempting to go for the immediate one. And what gamification can do is apply these interventions that keep you on the path, give you these intermediate goals and rewards to work toward so that you can hit that long-term goal of the weight loss. So is, am I hearing then that um, really the, the long-term goal is to awaken the intrinsic motivation and to, you know, to get to the point where it's like, <coughs> hey, I actually like how I'm looking. I really am enjoying these clothes that I never would have fit in a year ago, where I no longer need the Zamzi or the leveling up, or sometimes. the le leaderboard. Yeah, sometimes. The, the use cases are very different. On a sales 
team where you're trying to drive sales performance. That's not the goal, right? The goal is to drive sales performance. So keep it extrinsic. Basically, you know, the, your, your clients are like, yeah, 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 don't remove the points thing. This isn't about intrinsic motivation. Drive the extrinsic. Uh, we can talk a little bit about extrinsic versus intrinsic, but the, the whole idea is you're driving ongoing performance. Yeah. It is not something that should fall away at some point. Or you know, customers of ours like Adobe using it to teach people to use Photoshop. So now you're scaffolding up again to like a skill level where they can then take over and use it by yeah. themselves. But it's not always about just uh, getting them to a point and having it fall away. Okay. So I, I would I want to dive into kind of the frontiers of gamification. My guess is you're dabbling on those frontiers. But I wanted to know first, since we're you know on the on the you know the the perhaps it's largely digital platforms and creating new behaviors, uh, new digital behaviors. I'm wondering if you have anything to add. Well, you know, I think um, inherent. What I would add is inherently uh, gamification in the business environment isn't incentivizing. Doesn't mean incentivizing things that aren't good for people. Like, and uh, you know, I'll give you an example of something that's happening in the automotive insurance industry. So, um, one of the insurance carriers are actually allowing you to carry around a device in your car, and after 30 days, if you, they determine you're a good driver, you get actually lower premiums. And so, the end result is great, right? The the insurance company is going to get an increased margin. Um, the individual is actually going to save money, and hopefully, we're going to have safer uh, driving experience on the road. And they actually have implemented, that just touches the surface of what they can do with gamification. You can start actually incentivizing more game-like behavior within that experience. And so, you know, I think that just touches on the surface of what's going to start happening in these various industries um, just beyond, like, what you think of as traditional digital. Mm -hmm. You guys, um, you know, in medicine, we have our technologies that are kind of, um, way ahead of our ability to think through their implications over the long term. And as I was kind of preparing for our discussion, I was craving um, uh, some kind of gamification ethicist, right? So we have medical ethics that help us understand kind of long-term implications. And I'm wondering if you guys, um, if, if you guys ever, you know, worry about, um, uh, you know, because we're, we're kind of, one way to is a nasty way to frame it, but are we in the business of forms of addiction, right? Where it's like I'm hooked to my phone. I call this my second wife. This is not a game, um, uh, but we develop new behaviors that that often can look like OCD behaviors. And I wonder if you guys worry about that and how you, if your clients are kind of expressing concerns like that, and what you guys think as you kind of look squint into the future. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't say that that's not something that's coming out quite a bit, but I think there's another thing that's related that is, is going to be a big deal, which is the privacy implications mm -hmm. around some of this. So um, one of the things that, that we really focused on is, is tying identity, uh, who a person is, to these various behaviors. And as Rajat mentioned earlier, what we're really talking about here is big data. We're able to track in a more structured way everything that's happening and everything. And so... And we're actually able to tie it to who I am, to uh, a Facebook identity or to uh, other types of identity online. And when you start thinking about some of the, there's a lot of implications, I think, in healthcare and insurance and some of these in other industries. So for example, um, perhaps I'm using a, some sort of like, like one of those, I don't know if you've seen the basis watch, but it's a watch you can wear that is initially tracking some of your vitals, right? And it's really designed to make you healthier. But that's now being tied to my identity and it's gonna be tracking this over time. So let's say two or three or four or five years down the line, um, you know, I'm signing up to get uh, life insurance or something like that. And they're able to actually somehow obtain some of that information that somehow impacts my premiums. Or maybe it's something even more serious and it affects my ability to get a job or to get insurance or something down the road. And so, you know, I think we have to be cognizant that we're leaving these various data trails in these various applications that are starting to be I think a lot more impactful, and we have to start thinking about what the privacy implications are, mm -hmm. are there. And if you think about the Google Glasses, it even gets to a, even the bigger extreme, mm -hmm. right? Because now we're not just measuring ourselves, we're starting to measure those around us. And um, you know, I think I think there's ways to overcome a lot of these things, but I think there's these are things that we're going to have to think about as a as a society to to really move forward. So we're starting to approach the frontiers, and I'm wondering, Jim, you know, if you can give us a sense of uh, um, kind of in your lab, where you th see things moving, 
um, and some interesting, perhaps surprising um, areas that you might expect to see in the future in the market? Sure. <clears throat> well, I think uh, a lot of our focus right now is, uh, probably from your perspective, back to the future in that uh, we're working on a set of um, design patterns uh, that people can use when constructing games, uh, and it's the, the core of Sissy's dissertation. And what's nice is that these um, motivational design patterns are being tied back to uh, particular motivational uh, desires that people have. And so the, uh, there's a fellow named Stephen Rice who wrote a book in 2002 that laid out 16 of these core desires that people have, things like uh, power, need for exercise, romance. Mm -hmm. And uh, these patterns are being tied back to uh, these particular core 16 areas of, of uh, motivation. And I think what's nice about that is that once you understand how different design patterns correlate back to these core desires, you can analyze a particular game and say, okay, is this gamification effort um, you know, really uh, using mechanisms that end up uh, reinforcing what it is you're trying to achieve? And so uh, Chris found this great example. There's a, an app out right now to get you to learn more about the new upcoming Star Trek movie. Uh, and so your goal in getting this app is you are curious uh, because you want to learn about this new movie, uh, but the app is all about uh, you know, going up to movie posters and scanning them to get points so that, and it's not even clear like what happens when you get these points. And so, so the, uh, the design pattern that's being used are points, which ties into a sense of power and mastery, um, but what your core motivation is for getting this app is to be curious and to learn more about this movie. So there's this disconnect between the gamification approach and people's core motivation and, and going after this experience. What's that, what is that, dis that disconnect? That so the, the disconnect is that um, you know, the core motivations are different, that you know, your motivation, why you would ever use this app is curiosity. Um, the design pattern, the scoring uh, right. ties into power. Got it. And so they're just different, uh, different um, motivational desires. And in this case, um, you know, people are unevenly motivated by all of these. But uh, the, uh, you know, in this case, like you don't engage with this app to increase your sense of power and efficacy in the world. You do it because you like Star Trek and you want to learn more about this movie. Got it. So, if, so it seems like your starting point. You're talking about needs, and you're creating this taxonomy around needs that you can use as a game designer to um, pull, you know, pull different mechanics, if you will, to support different needs. And I'm wondering if it's actually kind of theoretically the same, right? In in the case you're talking about, the needs are the people's needs, and the needs you're designing for same mechanics, but it's uh, first the business and, th and then the, the end customer, perhaps. Would you agree with that? Yeah, we start with the business, but then we also, you know, I mentioned with the end user, we need to understand what motivates them. And so we kind of, we've gone out and looked at all the different motivational theory and we've kind of identified like what we think are the five key intrinsic motivators that get people going. And that's based off of um, self-determination theory, which is a couple of professors at the University of Rochester, Edward Jesse and Richard Ryan, came up with this theory. And it basically it says we're motivated by autonomy, so the ability to control like what we do when we do it, uh, mastery, feeling like we're getting better at something, or competence, and then relatedness, like we're all inherently social creatures and want to connect and validate and be validated and communicate. And then to those, we've added two others that we found like, really powerful. One is purpose, as kind of articulated by Dan Ariely in his book, uh, the upside of irrationality, and then um, progress. Teresa Amabile, professor at Harvard, uh, talked about you know how the number one most motivating factor at work is feeling a sense of progress, no matter how small, towards a meaningful goal every day. That's it, much more so than recognition, than pay, any of the rest of those things. So you take those five things, and you'll see that all these various gamification mechanics, the ones I listed off earlier, like you know onboarding and leveling up and all that kind of stuff, they all like map to one or more of those intrinsic motivators. And those are really good when you have something that's intrinsically motivating. Like I'm a fan of a TV show, or I want to learn Adobe Photoshop. Like I want to do these things. And then there's this whole class of jobs and, and tasks that aren't so intrinsically motivating, like filling out an expense report or making a sandwich at the local deli, right? And there you need to think about the extrinsic reward because I'm only gonna get so, you know, my mastery at making sandwiches is gonna hit a peak at some point, right? 
And then you need to figure out like what are the external motivators you can apply to people to get them to perform better, to want to do better rather than something that they have to do. And so I think uh, that's kind of the way we see the world. Cool. So uh, um, we want to turn it back to the audience here so because I think they, they probably have some burning questions. First, I want to ask you, since this is a frontier, we think a lot about designing for government. We actually, at where I work, design a lot for local governments, state governments, and designing new forms of engagement. And I'm wondering, as you squint in the future, what what, how gamification will play in the future in terms of the government and private pub public partnerships? You know, what do you see and uh, what do you fear? Sure, I, I think there's absolutely use cases here, both within the government uh, for employees. I, we were at the um, uh, at a government agency the other day, and they were complaining about their compliance training and how nobody was going through it. And like every month, they have a new uh, training course that they have to go through around all these different, you know, ethics policies, travel policies, whatever. Uh, so there's tons of opportunity just within the government for employees to use these mechanics, and then for kind of uh, engaging with the constituency, engaging with the citizens. You know, when uh, somebody asked me recently about like how would you gamify voting. And I'm like, well, the way I would do it, if, if I, I'd, I'd try two things, right, Ex as experiments. One would be to say, like, why don't people vote? Well, it's because they don't feel like um, there's any sense of accountability if they don't, right? I, I'm sitting here as an individual citizen, there's the country, and there's this, like, giant gulf in between. So what if somehow there was some notion of teams or collaborative effort, and my effort helped out the team, and the entire team would lose if I didn't vote? So whether it's my, my, my block, my city, my state, some accountability to somebody else, which we, we've seen works incredibly well in almost any situation, right? This peer pressure of not wanting to let your colleagues down uh, can, I think, be actually a really powerful way to get people to vote. And the other thing is um, giving people extra votes, right? If you vote for one year, then next year you get two votes. If you vote for three years, next year you get three votes. And that encourages people not to break the chain, right? Like if they don't vote for one year, they're all the way back down to one, and they only get one vote again. And so you give people extra voting power. Let's talk to Congress about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so uh, I'm glad to hear that you think about this stuff. We actually just launched a project to kind of reinvent voting in LA County. Um, so we should talk. So I want to, before getting off the government um, vein, I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts about about that. Sure. What, what gets me excited is this notion of taking activities where you want to engage a really broad set of people uh, in order to solve some big problem. So essentially doing a kind of crowdsourcing through the activity of creating an engaging game. And so you know, probably one of the better known examples of this is this uh, protein folding game that was made of Washington Fold It. Um, and uh, you know, here's an example where you know, you do draw very heavily from uh, game design to create uh, game-like experiences, but with this goal of crowdsourcing some kind of activity, in this case, trying to figure out the structure of protein. Uh, so we're very excited in taking that idea of creating games uh, with a crowdsourcing goal and then applying that in many different contexts. So this is like citizen science where you kind of uh, activate the army of kind of interested users. Absolutely. Yeah, there's uh, AKA you know, free labor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was astonished, you know, at the recent game developers conference to hear that, you know, there was this game Space Camp, which is like a very hardcore puzzle game, and it had, you know, tens of thousands of players, and I was shocked that, you know, like hardcore puzzle gamers were, you know, that big of an audience. And so that, you know, if you can tap into even just a small part of that core puzzle gamer mojo, mm -hmm. you know, that's a lot of people who are very smart working on your problem. Cool. So let's turn it to you. Um, we actually have two roving mics, and this is being videotaped. So if you have a question or a comment, raise your hand, and then a mic will come to you. Oh, that's OK. Hi, I'm Ted Kahn from Design Worlds for Learning. Um, I'd like to know something about the, um, the opinions of the panel about slowdown versus speed up. So, so many of the games and so many of the things on the app, and as you were talking about your phone being your, your second wife, et cetera, yeah. um, the autotelic kind of uh, a feedback that happens by quick responses and by always having to be connected, I think has a really interesting downside. And there are a number of people who have been writing about what it's like to slow down mm -hmm. and the mindfulness things that we're losing in terms of being rapid responders and gathering stuff together. So I'm wondering how this plays out in your views of gamification. I think, um, I, I, I mean, the things you're talking about are just kind of like they are in the air around us. Like we're the fish in the water and like that's happening. 
we don't have a choice about it, right? And uh, and one of the things that people love about games is the immediate fast feedback you get, that you immediately know whether you're doing good or you die, right? And so then you can either adjust your strategy uh, and you learn, and you use that to consistently evolve and get better. And that's kind of one of the, the hallmarks or tenets of gamification is this idea of really fast feedback and systems, because slow feedback systems just suck, right? Anybody who's tried to change the temperature in a shower where it takes like a minute for the water to change temperature, you know like how frustrating it is when that feedback loop is, is big. Or you take a, a flight and you land and like five days later you see the, the, like the, the point balance in your account go updated when it should have just been like as soon as you landed, you got like cha-ching, you just earned some points. And so this idea of like fast feedback as a way of, um, of learning really quickly in kind of a real-time format, I think it's really powerful. But kind of to your, your point about slowing down, I think, I think that that ship has sailed, right? Like the Gen Y, the millennials, they've grown up with this stuff. My kids are surrounded by iPads and technology and phones and like it's not gonna get any slower for them. And I think it's gonna be, uh, you know, maybe there'll be movements like slow food, slow tech. So uh, is, is mindfulness, <laughs> is that something we're, we're not able to game? Which is, it's it's yeah. a little bit of a hyperbole, but I think it's a super interesting challenge. Well, Zen koan. I, I think I, I think two things. One is when you figure this out, let me know because I'd like to slow down myself uh, once in a while. But two, um, I think there's an interesting trend around the quantified self, which is basically utilizing technology and devices to actually measure things that you're doing. And uh, why I think this is important is because it will allow you to start um, still using gamification, but happen it's happening inherently without you having to do anything. Like right now you have to pull out your iPhone mm -hmm. and track what you ate or, or how far you ran and all these things. And all this will just be happening inherently. And um, that's going to continue. Right now there's little tiny like devices you can tape on your skin like a Band-Aid that can actually measure like how much your uh, calories you're burning. So it's going to get pretty interesting there, I think. So um, there's a movement afoot uh, to kind of embed mindfulness and compassion. It's kind of arising in, in business schools, actually, which is super interesting. A couple weeks from now, we're hosting a little you know, uh, phase zero workshop uh, around mindfulness and embedding the idea of embedding compassion into digital products. I, I bet you would. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. So I think it's a really interesting challenge. And yes, I think the ship has sailed on uh, the connected world. But I think it's a super interesting challenge for gamification experts, um, such as us, to actually think how you use it to slow down and maybe use less digital products. It's a bit of a mind bender. Other questions? Yes. Hello, I'm Carol Blanchard, and I'm just a senior business analyst. And I, I was listening to how this sounds so universal. And the uh, uh, principles that you're describing are sort of what we wanted communities to do at one time, families to do, how we organized our companies. And there was always in the dream of at some point another click up where we were challenged to be conscious of our choices, be aware of the choices that we made, and, and, further and beyond that to a kind of character and character building. We even talked about character in the community after a while. In business, we talked about how we treated people, and then we talked about how that was good business. And I was wondering, and in, at the end of the day, I think we looked almost back, less at badges, and more about the effects of those choices that we made. So I was wondering if in gamification, there's a, a point where you begin to also raise the issue of choice and the, mm -hmm. and the cascade of personal choice. Jim or Patrick, do you have comments? And I guess I'll, you know, I'll talk somewhat tangentially in that you know, there are definitely starting to be researchers who are um, looking at patterns of game design and, and for gamification and realizing that some of them are actually um, ones that are, you know, uh, have as a broader outcome uh, things that are kind of evil or not really desirable. And so one, uh, I guess, example of this is when all the Facebook games started up and then people were really encouraged to send out notifications to all their friends and then it sort of quickly took over people's feeds. And so, you know, this ended up having kind of very global, very negative uh, consequences quickly uh, and then the system reacted. Um, so there are a cluster of these, um, you know, design patterns where uh, if you put them into your game, you can quickly, you know, take a gamification effort in directions that you might not like. Um, but, you know, I think uh, if, they are, if they are identified and if you start developing a sense that, uh, hey, these are ones that we want to avoid, uh, then that, 
you know, I think addresses some of your concerns. So um, I have a, a comment. Uh, um, Charles Duhigg, Duhigg's book came out about a year ago on habits. I don't know if you've, any of you've seen it. Kind of habits that kind of put habit formation front center, and you know, we think we kind of automatically think habits. If we just turn it into a habit, it'd be free sailing. And I think actually, to your point, is like actually let's unhabitize some things that aren't so good, become aware of them, right? Which is the unhabit part, uh, so that we can create new habits that actually meet our needs better. So I'm pretty intrigued by the idea of kind of you know building that awareness. The I, I think the 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 idea most of the decisions we make are automatic. We have no idea that we're making them. When we're driving, we're not thinking about turning left consciously. Um, and it's a little disturbing if you start to think about free will and actually we're, how much control are we in if we're just kind of always on automatic. Um, and it violates our kind of narrative that we have that I'm a rational human being and I will bring in data, evaluate the alternatives and select the one that has highest expected value. That's a nice narrative, but it really doesn't describe the real world. Doesn't mean you can't become aware. So I think gamification could be another tool that actually could unhabitize things so that we actually can start designing for the things we care about. So oh, I love that. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, hi, I'm Todd Young from Euclid, and I'm working on what I think is one of the most challenging problems in game theory, which is how do you make common core standard mathematics fun for a seven-year-old? So uh, my question is about how do these motivational theories, um, how are they a function of childhood development? What are your guys' thoughts on that? Can you point me to experts in the field? Uh, that, that's what I'm working on. Mm. Khan Academy seems to have used a lot of this stuff very effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, what, do, what do you think about that? Can you, can you get the microphone back to him? Sorry, please. Thank you. Sure. I, I, you know, I, I think Cal Khan's a genius. Uh, I've been to a lot of his presentations. I like what Khan Academy's doing. Uh, I obviously think there are a lot of room for uh, improvements and, and other products around Khan Academy. But I'm, I'm looking more at, uh, you know, motivation for, for younger kids and, and how, and, you know, you've got these different frameworks. You have five and he's got 16. And, you know, how do those things develop as, as, humans develop, you know, what, what does a seven-year-old framework look like? I mean, I have three boys, so I have a pretty good idea, but a lot of stuff we're not going to talk about here, but, uh, you know, what, wh th that's, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. Um, you know, I have a middle school age daughter, and she's doing Khan Academy for her math, and I'm just shocked at how well the badge system is working. Mm. Um, and so I, I have a suspicion that kind of points and badges probably work better for, uh, for kids and young, young adults and probably tend to work not as well as people get older. Um, but I haven't seen any hard data behind that. And I haven't seen a lot of study on kind of how sort of the motivational structure changes over time. I'm, you know, across these, you know, 16 core human desires and this uh, right framework, uh, you know, different people, um, you know, are more motivated by some desires than others. Uh, even as adults, um, I haven't seen a good kind of analysis of like, as a trend, you know, you're more motivated by certain things when you're younger and more by certain things when you're older. Um, but that seems, you know, it seems intuitive that there would be changes as you age. Um, but, you know, I haven't seen research that describes that change. Yes. Yeah, because it's on video, yeah. Kind of on the, my name's Moni, um, and kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum, for unstructured kind of brainstorming and creativity development, what are you using internally to kind of bring about innovation, bring about um, new ideas through, through the use of games? So, uh, I mean, I can speak from IDEO. IDEO doesn't have very many rules, written rules anyway. Um, but there's seven rules, and they happen to be brainstorming rules. Um, and you would challenge me to actually call them all off by memory. Um, encourage wild ideas. Build on the ideas of other, others uh, to, as a way to kind of create the context for support and optimism in the room. Because at IDEO, you know, 
uh, the devil's advocate is the devil because it completely shuts down creativity because now you're kind of defending ideas that are probably bad in the first place. So um, that's, that's one structure that we use at my company. Maybe you guys um, have others around creativity, gamifying creativity. <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't played in that area much at all. So um, I, I don't really know, aside from having been at IDEO and used those same rules. Thank you. Um, actually, there was a question here. Hi, my name's Tracy. Um, I'm going to- Tracy, we'll make this, unfortunately, the last, our, our party's just about over, so okay. you, get, you get the last say. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll end on the money question. Uh, so switching gears to commerce, um, I'm in the e-commerce field. And so what are you seeing as your inside enterprises uh, the use of gamification beyond the traditional loyalty and rewards programs that exist today, mostly for sort of our generation. What are you seeing in the use of gamification that we should be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, so look, the, the book I just wrote is called Loyalty 3.0, and the whole kind of thought process there is Loyalty 1.0 is the traditional loyalty program that we all know, right? Frequent flyer programs, buy 10, get one free. One uh, data stream coming in, this transactional data stream about purchase, and then one constituent being served, which is your customer. But what's happened now is all of a sudden you've got all this data, again, that your customers are generating. They're not just buying. They're writing reviews. They're star rating. They're sharing to the social networks. They're engaging in promotional offers. They're watching videos. They're doing all sorts of things on your commerce site. All that can be the raw material of a loyalty program. And also there's this notion, you know, I often talk about loyalty programs, traditional commerce loyalty programs, as having a beginning and an end but no middle. Right? You get really excited at the beginning when you sign up for this thing and you think about all the great things you're going to get at the end. And then at the end, when maybe you've gotten there and maybe you're getting great things or maybe you're just getting magazines, who knows. And then in the middle, there's this like giant gulf of opportunity where there's like no actual loyalty being generated. You're just grinding, trying to get to that end. And there's this huge opportunity in the middle to figure out how to engage and make your customers actually loyal using these gamification techniques. The same way that Hope Lab used them to keep kids on the track to, to losing weight and getting healthier, you can use the same thing to keep people more engaged and more loyal to your program. So I think there's huge opportunities in commerce, and we've recently signed several customers in that space. The, the one thing I would I just I agree and I'd add to that, which is data and gamification is almost becoming a differentiator. So here's what I mean. Uh, I think if you look at Nike Plus, it's really, really interesting what they're doing. Because they've, they've gone away from just having to come out with the, like, the latest, greatest shoe and get people to buy the shoe to people storing all of their running behavior data in Nike Plus. So there's a reason to buy Nike shoes if they're actually tracking data from your shoe next time, the time after, and the time after. And you can start to see some of these embedded devices, this quantitative self, in different clothing maybe. And so actually the data becomes a reason to go with that brand instead of another brand. So it sounds, it sounds like um, you know, the, the new loyalty is kind of the interaction is baked into the product opposed to some kind of bolt-on that's a, you know, from the coupon world, what have you. Well, I guess I'll yeah. you know, just add a cautionary note, which is uh, all of these efforts to increase engagement and to do gamification, you know, at the end tend to require additional attentional resources being focused on whatever that you know thing is. Um, we only have so many hours in the day. We have only so much time to spend doing these uh, attentional activities. And my guess is there's some point at which they all start competing with one another, and you know, taking on one additional gamification activity causes another one to be thrown by the wayside. And so there's. I think the limit to the gamification of everything, which is we only have so much you know, mindfulness, we can focus on things at any given day. So our time is up. Thank you so much for coming. I think um, we have some final remarks here. Thank you very much. Thank our speakers for sharing your perspectives so freely with us, and David for your very creative and effective way of leading the conversation. As a small token of our appreciation, please enjoy this Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome.